that for my classes. I need that when I walk in the door of my house. Just have that play. <laughs> I have arrived. That would be awesome. Well, I'm so glad you guys uh, came out. We have such great memories of what we did last time where we combined with other churches. Um, I told you that we're two and a half years into this project and we've learned a lot. And so I want to tell you one of the biggest finds that we have discovered, but let me do it by telling you a little bit about my background. I became a Christian through karate. I grew up in a non-Christian home. The only thing that would have got me in the church was karate, and Michael Crane had a ministry called Michael Crane's Karate for Christ. I love that, jujitsu for Jesus. I think that's awesome. And so I became a Christian and always wanted to get back to martial arts. So eventually, about eight years ago, I finally got back to martial arts, got my black belt in Shaolin Kung Fu, and now I'm doing Krav Maga, which is Israeli self-defense. It's much more simpler. I work in domestic violence shelters, teaching women how to verbally de-escalate and also how to physically protect themselves if they have to. Well, we have a saying in the self-defense industry that I think really applies to what we're going to try to do tonight. Here's the saying that really has struck me. 90% of self-defense is non-physical. 90%. It's verbally de-escalating. It's being aware of a, a dangerous situation before it actually happens. It's knowing how to walk to your car late at night. It's knowing what to avoid. Now, the 10% is for real. I and mean, if a person puts their hands on you or tries to attack you, you have to physically defend yourself. So here's what we have learned two and a half years in. The actual conversation most people want help with, we'll call it the middle conversation. That's you sitting down with a family member trying to talk about politics. Uh, it's you uh, sitting at Starbucks trying to have a conversation with somebody about pretty sensitive social issues, or it could be you trying to do evangelism. That middle conversation is not overly complicated, it's just that we can't do it. I mean, the middle conversation, you just don't need a seminar on how to have a good, productive conversation, right? Listen first, ask open-ended questions, gain information, don't use um, you statements, use I statements, try to find common ground, you got the middle conversation. Now, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called My Beg to Differ, using the book of Proverbs. If you want the research behind all of that and how the book of Proverbs really lays out a four-step model, then let me encourage you to buy I Beg to Differ. It's out there discounted, okay? Here's what we discovered. The middle one doesn't work because your emotions get involved. Your nose gets out of whack. Listen, I've been teaching this stuff for 20 years and been co-director of the Winston Conviction Project for two and a half, I just had a blow-up conversation with my brother Ken about politics. I mean, it, it was so bad. My wife came outside and she was like, and I didn't care. I was so mad. He, I love my brother. He's in full-time Christian ministry. We see politics about as differently as you humanly can see it. And he wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. I'm trying to use my model going, this does not work. <laughs> I wrote a whole book on this. It does not work. What the heck? Still buy it, though. But it does Right? So what we have discovered is that every middle conversation, there's two other conversations that will determine the success of that conversation. There's the pre-conversation you need to have with yourself heading in, and that's between you and the Lord, uh, we need to do spiritual disciplines to prepare for the middle conversation. But then here's what we've noticed. Even if the middle conversation goes well, and we've had some great conversations at Biola University with faculty that disagree, that we thought were a home run. We just had one about COVID and mask mandates. We have a woman at Biola who used to work for the CDC. Uh, now she's full-time faculty, but still does research for the CDC. We have a man, one of our most... Um, noted scientists wrote a book basically attacking the CDC, saying CDC is wrong a lot, and we never should have just gone with what the CDC said because they got it wrong about this pandemic. They actually made it worse. Well, there you've got two people. And so even if we have a great conversation, they can go back to their in-groups and get deprogrammed in a heartbeat. Right? Even if you think the middle conversation went well, you go back and your friends say, oh, no, 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 Democrats aren't like that. Oh, no, Republicans aren't like that. You were duped. And you're like, oh, you're right, I was duped. Yeah, 
So we have seen that these conversations we need to work on more than even the middle conversation. You can YouTube the middle conversation. You can just type in good conversational skills and you will get a billion hits. Now, not all of them are equally good, but there, there's some pretty good stuff out there, right? We got to work on the uh, first conversation and the last conversation. But to do that, I want to back the train way up and talk about reputation just for a second. So we know from uh, the scriptures that a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. Uh, we, Book of Ecclesiastes, a good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. By the way, do you know the most expensive perfume in the world? It's called DKNY. It's the collaboration of some different, uh, an artist and a designer. It costs one million per three ounces. My wife loved it. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, an elder, must have, of course, a good reputation with those inside the church. You can't be an elder and not have a good reputation. But notice what Paul says. But I also want him to have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. We're going to talk more about spiritual battle in a second. Now, why is reputation so important? Communication theorists have studied this forever. One of my favorite studies about reputation is called the Chaka Declare study. A communication theorist came up with a totally bogus study, mentioned a bunch of bogus scholars, and wrote it up saying there was something in chocolate eclairs, like some kind of enzymes, that if you ate one a day, you would lose weight. Okay, <laughs> totally bogus study, but, then he, but that's not the study. He would go into health clubs and present it, but just swap out the name of the institution that was arguing for it. Right? So he'd walk in, let's pick on my alma mater, Eastern Michigan University. And he'd say, hey, did you hear about this new study from Eastern Michigan University that a eat a chocolate eclair once a day, you'll lose weight? People laughed it right out of the room. Like, that's ridiculous. That's just so stupid, okay? The study was on what institution would get him to stop and actually consider it. That was the study. Now, just for a second, what institution was top ranked? Actually got people to think about a bogus chocolate eclair study. What do you think? What was the top institution? Harvard was uh, top five. John Hopkins, top five. Bay who said Baylor? That's beautiful. That's awesome. I love Baylor. I love Baylor. Love Baylor. They weren't in the top five. You know what it was? It was Biola University, where I teach. No, I'm just kidding. I hope, <laughs> I hope this goes online and my president hears that. Okay? Um, no, it was MIT. MIT, and a person would stop and go, really? Wow, where can I get that study? That was the study. Now, Aristotle said this. You want the secret of communication according to Aristotle. It is your reputation. If you have a good reputation, your chance of persuading somebody goes through the roof. Conversely, you have a bad reputation. It doesn't matter how good a communicator you are. The reputation, Aristotle said, precedes you. He called it ethos. Right? That is your perceived credibility. So the church, we've got to work on our perceived credibility. Now, this is going to be an interactive time, okay? Because I need us to think about two things very quickly. One, we won't think much on. What is the reputation of conservative Christians today? By those outside the Christian community, right? We could think about that. But I want you to more think about this. And if you have something to take notes on, I want you to just take a minute to really reflect on this. What is your reputation as a communicator? Like, how do people view you when they get into a conversation? Now, one of our lead philosophers at Biola University wrote a great book on self-deception. It's called I Told Me So. So I bet many of you won't even know what your reputation is. It would be really good to go ask somebody. So just in your notes, very quickly, I just want you to do what we call free writing. I want you to write down what you think your reputation is with other people. Do they think you're calm? Or do they think, boy, if I get onto this issue, you can't even talk to them anymore. So very quickly in your notes, kind of think what your reputation may be in a conversation. Go ahead and write that down. Okay, for the sake of time, here's your assignment. We call this perception checking. 
go ask people. If you're married, go ask your spouse. Go ask some of your kids. Ask a coworker. Ask somebody that's in your small group. Hey, here's what I think I'm like. I think I'm perfectly agreeable. I don't think I get crazy about politics or whatever, but have that, you know, a, a family, I speak at family life marriage conferences with my wife. Um, and one time a speaker said something that was just a stupid idea, but I did it anyway. He said, dads, I challenge you to go home and ask your kids, what would be one thing you could change about dad? What would that be? And like an idiot, I went home and did it. I grabbed my three kids, I said, three boys. I said, okay, if there's one thing you could change about dad, what would you change? Three hands shoot up immediately. I'm like, do you need some time to think about it? Nope, got mine, got mine. I'm like, what? I go, what would you change? All three of them, man, you're grouchy sometimes. Like when you got a project or you're facing a deadline, you're grouchy. I'm like, well, and you're grounded, right? You know, it's like, what do you mean grouchy? So go check your perception with other people. Ask them, but don't shoot the messenger. Don't, I mean, don't talk to somebody if you're just going to get what you want to hear. Actually ask a person to evaluate your communication. I think some of us will be very surprised if a person is willing to tell us the truth. It won't be all bad, but I suspect for many of us it won't be all good either. Um, So what's our enduring reputation as Christians? Well, we identified in Winsome Conviction that quarreling leaps out of the pages of the New Testament, that we are known to be quarrelers. The issue of quarreling leaps from the text of almost every New Testament epistle, whether the letter is long or short, 1 Corinthians or Philemon, quarreling is addressed. Whether the church is doing well or doing poorly, Philippians or Galatians, quarreling is addressed. Whether the tenor of the epistle is doctrinal, Romans, or personal, 2 Timothy, quarreling is addressed. I find it interesting when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says in the very beginning to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, I have been informed that there's quarrels among you. He states that they're all saints, and then literally six verses later, now what's this I hear that there's quarreling happening? This is just part of who we are. It's always plagued us. But now, because of social media, our quarrels are being made public. See, another thing for you to ask people is, what's my reputation online? Like, what's my... This is the crazy thing about online communication. We treat it like Mardi Gras. Like, all rules are off. Like, like, hey, I know I'm supposed to be respectful and kind and courteous and gentle face-to-face, but when I get online, it's like an alter ego. Some of you need to get offline. You just flat out need to give it up for a while because how you are communicating online is really doing damage to the overall Christian reputation. It's doing damage to your reputation. Now, we're going to get to another question. So as we've been talking to churches, this is the Mount Rushmore of issues we talk about. Uh, For sure, politics. Politics has done a huge number on the church today. It really divided Biola University whether we thought it was legitimate to vote for President Trump or not, right? That that still to this day is a sore spot among Biola faculty because we really disagreed on the answer to that question and kind of each one went to biblical precedent to kind of make their case. Uh, We could talk about mask mandates, right? Now, this hopefully this is kind of behind us a little bit. Uh, Social justice. How much of the gospel is social justice? Are you a social justice warrior, right? Um, But let's talk about race for a second. What is it about race that makes it almost impossible to talk about? We have found that when the issue of race comes up, people are offended right out of the gates, angry right out of the gates, hurt, and that communication just doesn't go well. Uh, Critical race theory is blowing up churches and and Christian organizations. I would make the argument virtually no one knows what critical race theory is. I had that in in my PhD program. Never thought twice about it when I got it. The way it was presented to me, never thought twice about it. I was like, this is great. This is really helpful to understand the systemic nature of racism. Now, even saying those words splits people immediately whether there's systemic racism. So turn in, your, turn in a group, like three or four people, and I want you to answer one question. We're actually going to run the mic. Why, does, why is the topic of race like this? Gender isn't like this. Sexism isn't like this. But when race is evoked, 
you get churches that are ready to split and very little productive conversations. So turn with me. We're just going to take three minutes and ask the people around you, why is it that race seems to be in a different category and we just don't do a good job talking about it? Okay, here's what we're going to do. Drew is going to run the mic, but I want you, if you're brave enough, just raise your hand of the little group that you were part of. I'd like to hear from some of you about why does it seem like race is in its own category of difficulty. So if you want to just raise your hand, Drew, I just want to hear a couple sentences of why, what your group came up with. Who would like to be brave enough? Oh, go ahead. When I took psychology many years ago, it talked about aversive racism. And I found that incredibly interesting to understand that there is deep undercurrents of racism that we don't even want to admit to. And when I started looking inside my heart, I was like, oh my gosh, it's there. It was crazy. Okay, thank you. Right, no, that's great, perfect. Anybody else? Um, I feel like it's two pieces. One is the communication, the we don't have common terms. We don't quite have a really hard time communicating what the different bins are. Or, you know, I say one thing, you are very tender for a very legitimate reason to a phrase or a, or a comment that for me means nothing, but for you might really truly be a javelin in the chest. Um, and so I feel like everyone's kind of aware and has had one or two of those conversations to where we're all kind of like, okay. We walk in real tender, and then the, real, the, the other side is because race especially has been put in a category where you run afoul of that. It's not, eh, you're kind of a jerk. It's, no, no, you are easily set into the category of you are a terrible person. Mm. The other, you are likely to have the other pe person believe that you are, you know, rotten to the core. And so it's low communication, high stakes. Oh, what a great way to phrase that. Poor commu communication, high stakes. I think it's a couple of things. One being, of course, you can't change the color of your skin. And right now it seems to be all about equality and superiority. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's so sensitive for people is because kind of piggybacking off of whoever said that over there, other guy, um, I think it's like, how do I say this? Either, like, when you enter these conversations, it kind of makes people feel like either they're the bad guy or the victim, and no one likes to feel like how they are without being listened to. Hopefully that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, now this is going to sound really weird. We need to treat race like the sex talk. Because one of the problems with the sex talk is we don't have it. Like we, so I get your students, I get your kids in my classes as a college professor, and they are thoroughly confused. But here's a couple of points I want to make. And by the way, I, it's hard to have that talk. It's crazy hard to have the sex talk. So I listened to Dennis Rainey, founder of Family Life. He encouraged all parents to have the sex talk with their kids. By the way, I was speaking at a conference of 1,000 people when I first did this. Now I do it all the time. I just spontaneously said, so 1,000 people, about 500 men. I said, men, how many of you, yet, your parents had the sex talk with you? Sat down, you could ask questions, and had it. Of the 500 men, 10 raised their hand. 10. There was a gasp from the women. Right? And I asked women, how many of you, and it tends to be a little bit higher for the women, but I could still count them. It was below, it was like, I think, 27. So I thought this was ridiculous. I was doing a master's at the time. I have three boys, right? So I sit my three boys down. I said, we're going to do the sex talk right now. Noreen's standing right next to me, and I just looked at my three kids, and I was like, dad has a penis. Okay? Um, Mom has... a special area. <laughs> it was an unmitigated disaster. My wife was rubbing my hand 
my sex talk ended with, let's go to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> that is how my sex, I was like, are you kidding me? It was horrible, horrible. So I called Family Life, said, you gotta have some material on this. They said, we do, we do. And so the, the first thing I read in this wonderful book was the problem with the sex talk is we think it's one talk. And of course it's gonna be weird. The sex talk needs to be multiple talks, so it's not a weird topic. So this, and Dennis, this comes from Dennis Randy. Sex talk needs to start when your kids are about six. Now, age appropriate, age appropriate, but, and again, Family Life has a ton of great resources. So by the time they're 13, 14, it's not weird, and now you're really going into specifics. The thing about the race talk is we never have it because we're, legitimately, we're afraid to have it. So, Drew, you said you're bringing in Isaac Adams? Uh, we're working on it. Okay, Isaac, I just interviewed Isaac Adams for Christianity Today magazine. Uh, he's got a book called Talking About Race. It is phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal book called Talking About Race, Isaac Adams. We need to have this conversation. We're gonna to have to give each other grace to have it. We're going to mess up. I, I took a class from Michael Eric Dyson at UNC Chapel Hill, my last class as a PhD student. It was on the politics of gangster rap music. He was defending gangster rap music, saying, listen, I'm sorry if you don't wanna see the ugliness of the American nightmare, but gangster rap artists make you look at it. And he played songs that were, I can't even repeat in this crowd. But he did this before the class started. I absolve you from having to say it perfectly. And that was an awesome moment. Now that was a classroom, it's not a church. So we, we could make mistakes and fix it because there was only about 10 of us. But we have got to find a way to have the, uh, the uh, se yes, we got to find a way to have the sex talk for sure. And second, we got to ha have the race talk. Here's one thing to say about both talks. The sex talk, your kids are getting the sex talk right now. I don't, care, I don't care if you're homeschooling, send them to a Christian high school or elementary school, via the internet, they're getting the sex talk. So better to get it in a place like a church, and they're also getting the race talk. And we need to co-op that talk and have it in productive ways. Now that's, that's gonna be a lot of work, but we've got to eventually get to the place where we can talk about race. Uh, because it is not going away in this country. It's only going to get worse in some ways if we don't find productive ways of talking about it. Um, <clears throat> now, let's get some advice from the Apostle Paul. The good thing about Paul is he kind of dealt with what we dealt with. It was in the forms of days and diets. This is the Church of Rome. Uh, Jewish converts are coming in. Gentile converts are coming in. Jewish converts want to observe days and diets. That's one of the most uh, important ways that they would show fidelity to Yahweh. And the Gentile believers are saying, no, I'm not going to, why am I going to be restricted? Paul said, I'm free. I'm not going to label with all your old Judaism. We need to get rid of that stuff. It was about to explode in the church of Rome. Paul steps in and he does some very interesting things. Let's just read what Paul has to say. Let not him who eats regards with contempt him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats for God has accepted him. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Now, this is what Paul's gonna do. He's gonna say, guess what? They both can exist in this church. Jewish converts, you can have your days and diets. You can uh, make it sanctified. Uh, you, there's room in this church for that. Gentile believers, you don't have to do that. If you don't want to, you don't have to do that. Paul is not gonna decide this issue. He's gonna give us three types of beliefs and then we're gonna to have to work within his structure. So very quickly, let's look at his three types of beliefs. First, confessional beliefs. These are theological and moral absolutes. This is what you have to believe to be a Christian, right? Uh, so that's the deity of Christ. It's the salvation and so, whoop. It's um, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible is God's inspired word, right? It's inerrant. That's what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. Paul's saying there's no wiggle room there. You gotta believe these things. Now you can choose not to be evangelical. You can choose not to be a conservative Christian, but this is what it means to be a conservative Christian. Biola University, Biblical Institute of Los Angeles, we've been around 108 years. Every year I have to sign the doctrinal statement. The doctrinal statement is not up for grabs. If you disagree with the doctrinal statement, any part of it, you can't teach at Biola University. Now, not to say you can't teach in other places, but our doctrinal statement is pretty conservative and you cannot go against the doctrinal statement. 
Paul calls those confessional beliefs. He said there's going to be no quarreling about confessional beliefs because that's not up for grabs. Make sense? Then he adds a, a second category. These are preferences, right? Paul says don't quarrel about spiritual gifts. They're all important. Don't argue which one's better than another. And don't argue about who baptized you. You were all baptized into Christ. I don't care if it's Peter, me, or somebody else. These are things that are not worthy of quarreling about. Then he gives us the middle one that's really, it's going to be really challenging for a lot of us in this room. He comes up with what is called disputable matters. A third category between absolutes and preferences. So do we observe days and diets? Paul says, you decide. That's not confessional. Um, so I, 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 again, have reasons for why you believe, but you can believe what you want to believe. Uh, there's no clear answer. There's just differences of opinion. Okay, it's like, wow, thank you, Paul. That was like supremely unhelpful. But what's really helpful is what he says, okay, now in the midst of disputable matters, here are some things I want everybody to do. Days and diets, Jewish believers, Gentile believers, here are the things you have to do. This is where it gets really convicting. Uh, first, we're going to have to recognize that there are differences within the Christian camp, not on the confessional things, but on a ton of other things, there's just good differences of opinion. All my seminary training is from Reformed Theological Seminary. I am not Reformed. I'm not Calvinistic. I'm more of an Arminian than a Calvinist. But my System One professor, Richard Pratt, who was phenomenal, said this, the mystery of theology is how godly scholars can intently study the scriptures and feel guided by the Spirit yet almost completely disagree over an issue. How, how does that happen? So Zondervan put out a really interesting series. It's called the Four Views series. What they do is they usually take two scholars on opposite ends of an issue. So what are some of the books here? Um, Divine Providence. What do we mean when we say God's sovereign? Do we mean that he micromanages and everything is his sovereignty. Uh, this tornado is going to hit that house, skip that house, hit this house. That is what we call the reformed position. Then you get what is we call a free will position where I'm in this camp, which is, hey, this is life in a fallen world. Tornadoes happen. It's not God creating a tornado, and it's not God directing the tornado. So you get two scholars. They are both going to the scriptures. Then they take two middle scholars that are kind of slugging it out in the middle, but the great thing about the series is they all interact with each other. Like they each state their case, and then the other three go, okay, what, what, answer this for me. How are you interpreting that word? I don't interpret that word that way in the Greek. What, you know, it's, it's great, and look at all the issues. By the way, there's over 20 of these. I just didn't stick all of them up there, right? Um, so creation, evolution, and intelligent design. Wow, did God use evolution to create the first human beings. Well, guess what? You've got uh, very intelligent Christian philosophers and theologians who believe, yes, theistic evolution. God used evolution. William Lane Craig, one of the top Christian apologists we have today, just came out with a book. It won a Christianity of the Year book, book award, saying God could have used evolution to create Adam and Eve. He, he could have done that. It's not incompatible with Genesis. Well, on the opposite side, you got a scholar who's saying, are you, what Genesis are you reading? Like, what Bible are you reading when you come up with that? Then you get two middle people. The roles of women in a church, the nature of hell, um, what's heaven like, or miraculous gifts for today. Well, listen, I don't think all these arguments are equal. Like, I read these, and I think some arguments are better than others, but that's not the point of the series. The point of the series is to say, good Christians really disagree on a ton of issues, and we've got to just learn to live with it. All right, now listen, if you believe God used evolution to create Adam and Eve, you can't be at Biola. One of the things we have in our doctrinal statement is, specifically, God did not create, God did not use evolution to create Adam and Eve. Remember, this is the Scopes monkey trial, right? So Biola's been around forever, so their doctrinal statement is rooted in real life. You know, the Scopes monkey trial was evolution on trial, and so the founders of Biola came out and said, yeah, we're not doing that. So if you believe God used evolution, that's okay. There is biblical warrant for that, but you can't be at Biola. 
It's okay for us to have an opinion, but we can't talk disrespectfully about people who hold other opinions. Does that make sense? Biola believes that hell is eternal, but there are really good theologians, John Stott being one of them, who believes that one day God will get rid of hell. He will judge everybody. They will be in hell, but out of his mercy, he will get rid of hell. Now, guess what? If you believe that, you can't teach at Biola University, but we can't talk negatively about John Stott. John Stott's one of the finest um, uh, theologians we've had, and he just passed away recently. So we're going to have to live with the tension. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, that ticks me off. If you think God used evolution, you're an idiot, right? That is exactly what Paul's going to get at. That attitude, Paul's going to step in and say, Gentiles, do not look at the Jewish believers and call them idiots because they want to observe days and diets, vice versa. We, we have to get past that. Listen, the Bible's really interesting book. On one hand, God can lock it down when he wants to, right? He, he can give us the deity of Christ. He can give us the inspiration of scripture. He can give us salvation found in Christ alone. He can lock it down when he wants to. But then why doesn't he do it with other things? Now, I teach a gender class at Biola University, Gender, Culture, and Communication. Well, one of the big disagreements among theologians is the role of women, right? Um, complementarians believe the man is the spiritual head of the marriage. This is based on Ephesians chapter 5, that, that um, Christ is the head of the church, just like we are the head of the marriage. We imitate Christ because we're the spiritual leaders. It's called complementarianism. Egalitarianism says no we are co-equals in the marriage. We, we co-lead this. And they use Ephesians chapter 5 to make their argument. They both do. So in this class I taught, I had one of the top complementarians at Biola University come into my class. I give him an hour and a half. Dude, make your argument. You go for it. And he goes for it. When he is finished, it's a three-hour block class. When he's done and walks out of that room, everybody's like, well, that settled that. My goodness, that is like amazing. That was, right? I said, okay, hang on, hang, hang, hang on. I bring in Ron Pierce, one of the top egalitarian theologians in the entire world. Ron walks in, does an hour and a half, and I tell all of them, ask your questions when they're here. I was a former theater major. Ask your, I had mind classes. Ask your questions while they're here. They kind of do, but when both of them leave, every hand goes up. Every one of them. And I'm like, what? And they're like, who's right? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I I man, did you see how they argued the Greek? Yeah. I don't know. And they both feel affirmed by the Holy Spirit. Now, turn in your groups and ask, how can that be possible? How can it be possible? How can this quote be possible? How, how does this work? In your groups, talk about the quote. How, how can you have theologians absolutely dedicated to the inspiration of Scripture, know more Greek and Hebrew you'll ever know in your entire life, and go to the exact same passage and say, you are, you are wrong in interpreting Paul? He's not saying that. He's actually saying the opposite. In your groups, ha, ha, why, why does God allow that to happen? Talk amongst yourselves. Theologian Drew. <laughs> I want to hear from you, why can this happen? What, what's going on? Why can this happen? I wanna, so go ahead and raise your hand, and I want to hear from your group real quick. Oh, go ahead, right there. This wasn't my idea, so I can, it was David's. Um, <laughs> he had the comment that if everything was yes, no, then you'd never have good discussion, right? If it was so cut and dry in the Bible, you'd never have development of relationships. Oh. You'd never have disagreements. You'd never have the opportunity to engage and the opportunity to grow together. That's really good. Anybody else? Why, did, why, why can this happen? Go ahead. I just kind of want to add to what he said, and that is that 
if it was all cut and dried, it would kill our relationship with God as well. The conversation would be shut down because there'd be nothing to talk with him about. Mm. Mm. And he specifically says the glory of kings is to search out a mystery. Mm. And he specifically draws us into relationship for that conversation, wanting each of us to come to him and dig through how he wants us to live our lives. He doesn't want conversation about everything. I mean, he locks things down pretty clear. And Paul goes after you if you don't get, uh, he goes after the Judaizers because they're changing the gospel, right? Go ahead. Um, I also, I don't know how we get to different places in our beliefs, but I know that Christ wanted his church to be diverse mm. so that the only thing that explains how we're brought together is him. And so I think he threw a little spice in there. He was just like, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, so let me make two quick comments. One, I loved my time at Reformed Theological Seminary. They were awesome professors. I, I, I do not think Calvinism is, I don't think it works as a system. It may make sense of parts of the scripture, but you lose virtually the entire scriptures if Calvinism is true. Here's the problem. I had to read Burkhoff, Calvin, Luther, John Frame, and these are brilliant theologians. Brilliant. So am I convinced in my Calvinism against it? Yes. But I go to bed at night knowing Luther disagreed with me, Calvin disagreed with me. That's why I go to bed with C.S. Lewis under my pillow every night. <laughs> Okay, so that's it. Now, let me, let me defend Richard Pratt for a second. This is what Pratt would say. In the mind of God, is it resolved? The answer is yes. In the mind of God, it's resolved. I think when we get to heaven, I don't think God's going to do an information dump. I don't think he's going to say, okay, on three, all the questions are answered. One, two, three. Dang it. It was Calvinism. Right? <laughs> so I got it. Right? I just need a minute. You know what I mean? No, I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're going to continue to, to talk about these disputable matters. But here's going to be the really cool thing. Somebody's going to say, well, look, uh, Calvin's right there. Calvin, come here. Calvin's going to walk over. Calvin, what do you, well, okay. Since I've been in heaven longer, here, there, there's other things God's been giving us. And now these other things, I still think I'm right, but... Okay, well, what did Lewis say about it? Well, he's on a smoke break right now. It's like, okay, go get him. <laughs> Lewis was a chain smoker. Come here, come here, come here, come here. W won't that be amazing? And then maybe every million years, God goes, okay, one more piece of information. What if this was true? Oh, my goodness, that changes. What? Now we're all talking again. Remember, God's unfathomable. That's Romans chapter 11. I don't think he's going to end the discussion. Right? He wants his children to wrestle and think about him in complex ways. So there's things char charismatics get right about God that other people don't. And I think it's the mosaic, Richard Pratt said, that God's kind of interested in. Is God sovereign? Absolutely. Does he love free will? You better believe he does. So it's the mosaic God's kind of interested in. I thought that was kind of interesting. But we're going to have to live with this tension. Now, this is what Paul says. Okay, now here's guidelines when you all talk about this. Here's what Paul says to the church at Rome and to us. <clears throat> All right, number one, do your homework. I love what he says in Romans 14, verse five. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. And you are gonna have to give an account to God. I'll have to give an account to God, everything I've written, everything I've taught, and my theological beliefs. I'll say, well, God, okay, this is what I read it this way. And it'll be an interesting conversation. But just know, every one of us is accountable to God for our theological beliefs um, and our political beliefs. We're going to have to explain that to God. So we can trust each other that we're doing our homework. Now, here's what's happening. We don't trust each other. We don't trust each other at Biola. We don't trust each other in churches. I'm doing my homework. I don't think you're doing your homework. Or you're, you're doing your homework from really crummy sources. I'm using better sources. Well, Paul says, hey, hey, relax, do your own homework. Now, I would say doing your homework is you have to read broadly. Like, like InterVarsity Press put out a great series by two leading Arminian theologians, two Calvinist theologians. One book is called Why I'm Not a Calvinist. 
One's called Why I'm Not an Arminian. And, you, and I have my advanced students read that. Now they walk away going, now one mistake they can make and the younger generation makes this, well then it's relativistic. God can, the Bible can say whatever you want it to say. No, that's not true. These men, these theologians, carefully laid out their argument and they were using scripture to do it. But we're going to have to live with this tension, especially with an election coming back up in 2024. We're going to have to live with our decision. I don't think, I don't think there is one way that God is saying you have to vote X or Y. I do not think God's saying that. I think he's going to lead us in different directions for different reasons, right? I mean, I feel affirmed by the Holy Spirit in how I voted, and yet my brother Ken really disagrees with it. Well, I don't know how to explain that other than it's the tension of the mystery of Scripture, right? On the disputable matters, not on the confessional matters. <clears throat> Second, this is huge, do not despise others. Paul says, I do not want you to condemn each other. That's what's entered the argument culture today. Democrats despise Republicans, and Republicans despise Democrats, right? In our theological beliefs, egalitarians despise complementarians, and complementarians despise, I mean, we just go after each other. And Paul is saying, I do not want that, right? You let people have their convictions, and if it's not a foundational issue, you must allow for divergent views. You have to allow for them. Next, I want you to show self-restraint. This verse ought to hang above every church, right? And we ought to have Velcro with the food part, right? So when it comes, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food, Paul is saying, we need to have Velcro and it needs to change every week. You need to walk in this auditorium. Are you taking notes? Because <laughs> I'm leaving at tomorrow morning. So do this, it'll probably ruin the church. But it'd be a fun thing to try. Um, so you walk in, it says, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of critical race theory. Pop, that's up one week. Good, tick everybody off. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of politics. Do not tear down the work of God for the age of the earth. Do not tear down the work of God because of evolution. I think Paul is saying, we're stopping the work of God everywhere. And that's what we've seen with the Winston Conviction Project. We are literally, we're stopping the work because we can't work with each other. So everything grinds to a halt because we're not unified anymore. COVID separated us forever. And now we're coming back together and we've lost the ability to be unified in our differences, right? Now we're going to have a q and a if, if, if you're sitting there going, I want to ask you a question. Well, I'm just going to try to run out the time. No, I'm not. No, after this break, I want a Q&A time. I want to hear what you're thinking because I want to react to what you're saying. I want to clarify some things too if, if things are misunderstood. Then he says this, start a dialogue, not a quarrel. Paul says, so then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That's what I want you to focus on. Let them do their days and diets. But listen, don't be an idiot towards days and diets. Don't you rub it in their face that you're not doing it. Don't you be eating food that they've said is, is on the list to be avoided. Don't you dare do that in front of them, right? And don't you, you days and diets people, don't you make Gentiles feel like they're not as religious as you are because they're not following your days and diets? Paul said, I don't want any of that, right? Do not have contempt for each other, your brothers and sisters. Look what Book of Proverbs says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. There's a big difference between having a debate and a quarrel. Now, report from the front very quickly. Um, every one, I've said this before. Every one conversation is really three conversations. There's the pre-conversation, mental, emotional, and spiritual preparation. We're finding that people aren't doing that. We're just jumping into a conversation, and it's going sideways very quickly. So after the break, we can talk about what does it mean to walk in the power of the Spirit? What does it mean to do spiritual disciplines? I think we need to revive this idea that Paul says, discipline yourself for the sake of godliness, and we need to have a game plan of what that looks like. Then there's the actual conversation. That's what I beg to differ is about. It's my four-step method that we use at the Winsome Conviction Project, but it's in book form, and I beg to differ. Uh, Post-conversation, how do you speak about other people in your in-group? Man, we've got to tighten this up. The way we talk about other people in our in-group is unacceptable to God. I mean, we, we um, have to be gracious and get rid of slander and contempt and bitterness, and we just crucify people in our in-groups. 
And the way, so we say in communication theory, the way you talk privately about a person is how you treat them publicly, right? So we've got to, listen, I don't care how you voted, right? This is my class, I'm kicking into my professor mode. In my class, can you disagree with President Biden? The answer is yes. I teach advanced classes on engaging diverse perspectives. But you must call him President, Trump, President Biden. You don't call him Biden. And there's nothing about his, I'm not doing ageism in this class. I'm just not doing it. So if you're picking on him because of his age, then you're gonna have to justify that. And you, you don't just get to say it. And by the way, you talk about President Trump. Last time I checked, he was president. You call him President Trump, right? So we're, we're, we're gonna have to tighten up our language towards each other. Is it fine to disagree with people on campus? Sure, but respectfully. And, and it's hard to do it first. Well, I'll tell you what, Hillary, excuse me, Secretary Clinton? Oh, yeah, Secretary Clinton, yeah. Right, let's get decorum, let's get decorum back into our conversations, right? California, guy raises his hand and says, oh, hey, dude, on the syllabus, I said, excuse me, it's doctor dude. <laughs> he sent me an email saying, hey, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean that, well, you know, I mean, hey, it's Dr. Muehlhoff or my liege. Either is acceptable. <laughs> so we need to tighten up how we talk about people in our in-groups because that's creating emotional contagion and then we're destroying conversations before they start. That's the work of Daniel Goleman. The internal attitudes you have towards people, they already know it. it he called it like catching a virus. You catch a person's emotions. So guess what? We're not told to act like peacekeepers. We're told to be peacekeepers. We're not told to fake speaking truth and love. We're told to actually love the people we're speaking truth to. Does it make sense? We need to have heart transformations. I think we need to see a revival in the American church today where we just aren't, we are just going to change how we talk about people. We're not going to say anything anymore for a season until we can grow spiritually. Have I already got my honorarium check yet? <laughs> okay, Dave, okay. I want to close with the thoughts of two women. I think both of these women are brilliant. And one of them is going to get me in trouble. I can't believe it gets me in trouble, but it does. Okay, so you talk about tensions with Russia today. Uh, um, um, Dave asked me this on his podcast. He said, is this really the worst times have been? And I'll tell you unequivocally, this is not the worst it's been. It has been far worse. Um, World War II, right? Now, what's happening in Ukraine is heartbreaking. But imagine a world at war. Uh, imagine the Cold War where, where people were threatening each other with nuclear weapons. So Nikita Khrushchev goes to the General Assembly of the UN. This is where he famously, now he didn't take his shoe off, most likely, and pound the, the table. But he said this to America, you try to stop us, and we will bury you in a nuclear winter. I mean, he said it very publicly, and everybody got what he meant. So Eleanor Roosevelt's in the audience. She gets crucified for her response to Khrushchev. She invites him to tea. To tea. And he accepts. New York Times wrote about it. It's a fascinating article. This is, what, this is what the rationale she gave in the New York Times. We have to face the fact that either all of us are going to die together, or we're going to learn to live together. And if we are going to live together, we have to talk. I love that. Hey, if she can talk with Khrushchev, you can talk with a brother or sister in this church you disagree with, right? Now, let me mention uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, so, so get a load of this. When um, Kavanaugh comes on to the Supreme Court, Sotomayor greeted him and welcomed him on the Supreme Court. Now, listen. They disagree with each other A to Z. It'd be pretty hard pressed to find anything they agree with each other. But she said this publicly about Kavanaugh. I love this quote. When you are charged with working together for the most of the remainder of your life, it's a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court, you have to create a relationship. The nine of us are now a family. And we're a family with each of us our own burdens and our own obligations to others, but this is our work family, and it is just as important as our personal family. When you know you're gonna spend the rest of your life working with a person, you make it work. Men and women, we are the family of God. 
We got to make this work. Okay, now in the book, Winsome Conviction, we talk about, is it time for you to leave a church? We, there could be times that you just have to leave a church because you no longer agree with the disputable matters part, right? And I, and I think Paul would say there, there's reason to leave if you have to leave, but do it with respect and kindness. I think that's the last resort. Um, but we got to figure this thing out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick, Drew, how long? 10-minute break. And then we're going to come back. I'm going to talk just for a little bit of what, what does it mean to walk in, in spiritual disciplines, because we got to start doing it, discipline ourselves for godliness. And then we're, it's Q&A time. So you can ask me any question you want to, uh, and I will try to answer it as best as possible. But we need to have these public conversations. Okay, so a 10-minute break. And then uh, we'll call you back in. All right, thank you. Hey, let's do, some, let's do some questions right away, but I want to clear up one thing that was brought up to me I thought was great. So I want to be very clear. I don't think the church splits over CRT, critical race theory. I think critical race theory has some very valuable things. It has some things that obviously we cannot borrow into a Christian worldview. That's true of a lot of things. Um, I, so I don't think the church splits over that. It could be that the next time there's a racially motivated killing and part of the church says, we need to take all of our resources and go after this issue. Like we need to pull back in other areas and we need to really go for this. Well, half the church is like, okay, yeah, that's an important issue, but we're not ready to stop everything. It could be after a lot of discussion, a lot of prayer, that maybe part of the church goes, we just feel strongly enough about this. We need to align ourselves with the church that would really make this the full fulcrum of what the church is about. But that'd be after much discussion, much prayer. Uh, I would not easily leave a church, but there might be sometimes that God's just leading people in a different direction. I don't think CRT is that. I think the issue of race is an important issue that we have got to deal with as churches, how much time and effort we're gonna put. And I just don't wanna say that everybody has to put in the equal amount of resources. Make sense? Okay, good. Drew, questions. Anybody have questions? Oh, great. Well, because Jesus is laying the seeds for the church and Paul is administering the church. It's really Peter and Paul are the CEOs of the church. So yeah, for sure, Jesus is laying the foundation, but to, I find it interesting that Paul is the one who has to now what does this actually look like for the Church of Rome? Like, we got to work this out, right? So that's a great question. Um, to me, Peter and Paul are trying to say, okay, having been with Jesus, now what do we do? How, how do we work this out? So that's a great observation. Yeah. So as a small group leader, we're always thinking about discipleship. And I'm thinking about, you were saying, with our kids, we need to have the race talk. But within the church, there are a lot of people who are beyond being children that maybe still need to have the race talk. As like small group leaders or as a church, how would you see that best done? Like, is a small group too crazy of an environment to do that? Do you try to do it one-on-one? -on -one? Like, how, how would you see that playing out in a body like this? Well, here's, here's where I want to compliment Drew. <clears throat> I think institutes like this ought to be everywhere. I think all churches should be trying to do what your church is trying to do, which is an institute that periodically brings people together and talk about different issues. And, and I think this is a great forum to start the conversation, but then I think small groups can continue that conversation. So that's where I think somebody like Isaac Adams would be brilliant to come in. He's written a great book, and the book has a study guide. So I think we, we have the start of it to an institute like event like this, but then we carry the, on those conversations in our youth group. I, I think it's great to think the whole church is talking about the same topic for a period of time. Now that takes organization to do, but I think an institute is a great way to bring up a topic and then let's have follow through and what would the follow through look like? But it needs to be at all levels of the church. I, I really commend the fact that we have so many of the youth of this church here, because I'm honest, I'm serious when I say it, they're the ones who are going to turn it around and, and just have a new generation of values, biblical values, and, and get rid of the argument culture. Yeah. So a question about the pre-conversation. You know, I think of you even mentioning the word CRT as a trigger for some people in this room, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I think oftentimes that pre-conversation is us digesting a topic in our social media and in-group circles. Yeah. That leads to yeah. perceptions about something that may or may not be true. And I think CRT is a great example of that. Yeah. What advice do you give for people on how to engage in that pre-conversation in a way that it balances their perspective going into a conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're wrestling with that at the Winston Conviction Project. We're going to create a website that you can go and practice, where, where you would type in what you are politically, socially, and then we would give you different perspectives. Now, a site already exists like that that I would encourage you to go to. It's called allsides.com. So you go there, they pick the left, the right, and the middle. And you read about a major event, but you read the best of the left, the best of the right, and the best of the center. That, to me, I just learned to practice when I read somebody really good, I'm like, oh, I had not quite thought of it that way, or that's a good point. So we need to start increasing what, the information that we're getting. So listen, when it, and again, when it comes to critical race theory, most people don't know what it is. So I think we just read a book, a serious book by serious academics. It's called Critical Race Theory and Introduction by a married couple, Harvard. Uh, her last name is Stefanik. His last name is Delgado. And it's called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. It is, I found it very compelling. I, I found it well argued. It wasn't antagonistic. Now, a friend of mine said, hey, you need to read R White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And that got me going. Because I think she's push she's very good writer, very good academic, but she's pushing buttons. And so if you say critical race theory, most of us are going to say, okay, what book are we talking about? Are we talking white fragility or critical race theory and introduction? Now, my friends at Biola will say, I'm not worried about Tim Mulehoff. I think you have enough critical thinking skills to see the good and the bad. I'm worried about our young faculty who maybe are taking all of CRT and not filtering things out. I think that is a totally valid concern. So I would say you, re you read widely and discuss it as you go along in your private life. Like, I, I want to make sure I'm hearing all perspectives. So again, I told you, I'm not a Calvinist, but I need to periodically read a good Calvinist because it just makes me realize these are good people who are really smart, love the Lord. And yeah, I don't agree with how they're interpreting that passage, but I can see how they got it. I mean, I can see it. I just don't agree with it. It's good for me to remind myself really smart people are on the other side when it comes to disputable matters. Yeah. So uh, we need to prepare our heart by reading broadly being charitable to other people's views um, is one way we just start to understand there's really good people on the other side. And if you're in a place where you say, that is not true about this issue, there are no other good people on the other side, I think that's what we call my side bias, is, is that you are not reading broadly enough. If you think they're all idiots on that side, I, I just don't think that's true. And I would encourage you to read more broadly. Or go talk to people who represent the other side and let them explain what they believe. I think we need to do that more broadly. All right, how about one more question, and then I want to talk about spiritual disciplines. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, great. So how do you approach people who are hostile to the faith? I don't think you can do it directly. Uh, like, like if somebody came up to me and said, hey, are you open for a conversation where I'm going to talk you out of a belief in Jesus? I probably would say, yeah, I'm not open. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just, I've dedicated most of my life to this. So I'm, I'm not, you know, and especially if they're doing it in an ugly way, I'd be like, I'm not open for that. So Paul seems to take an indirect route sometimes. This is where he says, feed your enemies. By the way, there's another book you need to read called The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark, a sociologist, who said, plagues hit the Roman Empire. They devastated the Roman Empire. 30% mortality rates. Rome freaked out. We have letters from emperors saying, Romans, help Romans. This is embarrassing. We're all dying in the streets, and Romans aren't helping Romans. We, we're better than that. We are Romans. Well, guess what? The church pops up and says, okay, what are we going to do about this plague? Do we just care for our own, or do we actually go out and help the very people who have persecuted us? And the church decided in droves we would go out and help people. 
And guess what? Christians died. The plague took many Christians. There's a very famous Easter letter written by a bishop who is commending the families for giving up loved ones for the cause of Christ. And Rodney Stark argue, argues those three plagues, people change their perspective about Christians. Like, hey, say what you want about a Christian, but I got a brother who lived because they went and got him out of the gutter. I mean, say what you want about those guys, but guess what? I know my sister has a friend who's alive today because of those Christians. So I would say a person who's hostile to our faith, we, we need to go to them and care for them. Remember Sharon from this morning's sermon? Sharon and I, if we sat down and had a conversation, we wouldn't agree on much. But the fact that I helped her in a time of need changed the tone that maybe we could have future conversations. We need to look for those opportunities. And let me give you one big one. The transgender community has 40% attempted or actual suicide rates. We need to say as Christians, that is unacceptable. People within our community, 40% suicide rates, actual or attempted? We need to stand up and say, listen, listen, we've got a debate about sexuality, okay? Duly noted. We also have opinions about the NCAA, about men and women competing. All right, fine. But guys, 40%? That's not happening on our watch. We're stepping in. I'd, I'd go right to the trans community and say, what do you need? You need money? What do you, what do you need? Research? We're, 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 this is unacceptable. And if they say to us, well, it's some of your preaching that's causing it, then I would say, okay, talk to me. What are you hearing from our community that's causing people to think about suicide? We need to stop it. Even if we think we're right about sexuality in the scriptures, we need to care for community members. And when, when people start to see that, I think um, they're going to maybe change their attitudes about Christians. Remember, our reputation changes. Now we have an opening we didn't have before. A friend, so we have the Winsome Conviction podcast. We invited the Reverend James White on it. And he said, this is what bothers me about Black Lives Matter. It's, it's like you running up to a traffic accident, popping your head in the window and saying, see, you should have been wearing seatbelts. That is not the time to say that. He goes, what really bothers me about my white brothers and sisters is Black Lives Matter finally gets our attention. Finally, we're talking about racial issues. And the first thing my white brothers want to say is, well, they're against the nuclear family or they're Marxist. As if that's a get out of jail card that you don't have to talk about race. That's walking up to the traffic accident and saying, yeah, I told you. Seatbelts, right? No, I think we need to lead with compassion. We need to say to our black brothers and sisters, man, the pain that you feel is, is I mean, it must be excruciating, right? Isaac Adams, if he comes here, man, he'll list off name after name. He'll stand here for five minutes and give you name after name after name after name because it wasn't just the latest racial killing. It's a, it's a history of it. And they're mad, angry, and frustrated. And the first thing we got to do is sit in their hurt. But I pushed Isaac. I pushed him in this Christianity Today interview. I said, but Isaac, do I ever get to say anything? Am I perpetually the listener? Do I ever get to critique African-Americans? And he said, yes. But check your heart why you want to do it quickly. I said, ooh, this is my interview. That, no, that was inappropriate. That's not going to make it in my interview. But, you know, I, so I think we need to have a heart change. I think we need to have a heart change. Um, so we did this podcast. We flipped a coin. And uh, we said, okay, tails, President Trump, heads, President Biden. So uh, we flipped it. I got um, President Trump and Rick got President Biden. We each did a podcast of nothing about positives about the two candidates. Nothing but positives it was sure to tick off everybody. I learned things about President Trump I had never known. I, I, I didn't know that his brother died of alcoholism. That's why he doesn't drink. So one president who's really made a difference in the opioid crisis has been President Trump. When asked why, he said, man, when you watch a brother die of an addiction, it does something to you. I, I didn't know any of that. Right? Now, it doesn't change how I vote, but he was humanized. President Biden, he, he's in the, the Democratic debates, 
And Pete Buttigieg is sitting right next to him, and President Biden is going through his rosary. Buttigieg leans over and says, what? excuse me, what are you doing? He said, well, this is a rosary. I'm praying for the debate. I've actually just prayed for you a couple minutes ago. And they had a conversation about faith and God and why he chose to believe in God. I, I didn't know that about President Biden. So what it did is it humanized both people, and it ticked everybody off. <laughs> everybody was mad, right? And I'm like, wait, because we humanized a person? I don't get that. I think we should humanize people. They're made in the image of God. We should humanize. Even as we disagree with them, and even as we push back, which we're called to do, we have to do it in a way that's humane and respectful and things like that. Okay, so let me talk about walking in the power of the Spirit real quick. So what does Paul mean when he says, exercise yourself for the sake of godliness? Well, I think we've over-spiritualized it. So let's not pick godliness just for a second. Let's pick golf, okay? So if you came up to me and said, hey, I want to I wanna play golf. Okay, I'm not a golfer, but what would I say? Come on, I, we could break up into groups. We just don't have time. How do you learn golf, right? Well, I don't know. I would, I'd find a golfer. I'd find a person who knows how to golf. I would YouTube it. I, I would learn some techniques. I have a son who's a really good golfer. His first paycheck as a physical therapist, he had specialized golf clubs made, right? That cost a ton of money. He won't ever let me hit with it, which has been hurtful. Um, on the driving range. But he, right? And then my son would say, because I, I, I'm bad at golf. Why? I only play once a year. Every Father's Day, we go golfing, me and my three boys. And I, I always do this, like the day before, I go out and buy 100 balls and a bucket of balls, and I sit there, and I'm whacking balls, spraying them everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, why did you not take a couple months and do this? Tomorrow you're on the golf course with your three sons, right? Noreen and I did dance lessons. Noreen said, let me pick something really fun we could do. I was like, yeah. And she goes, salsa dancing. And I'm like, Wow, I didn't see that coming. So we get a lesson, and then we didn't practice, and we'd show up the next week and make all the same mistakes. Finally, my wife said, you know, we ought to practice between lessons. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. That's, that's what Paul is saying. Listen, some of us, David Whitney, who writes about spiritual discipline, says the American church is a mile wide and an inch deep. We have dabbled in everything and mastered nothing, he says about the American church. So Paul is saying this, discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. So just like you would learn golf or you'd learn how to dance, you learn to discipline yourself for godliness. Now, I get that in golf, right? You, there's certain clubs you have to learn how to use a driver, a pitching wedge, a nine iron. But then how does that translate to spiritual disciplines? Well, we know from spiritual disciplines, what's the foundational discipline? This comes from Dallas Willard, one of our top writers on this issue. He's passed away, but he said it's solitude. Solitude is the foundational discipline. So you sit, you turn off all electronics, you sit before the Lord, and you say, Lord, I give you permission like King David did. Search my heart and see if there's any evil ways in me. So I would sit with the Lord and say, what is my communication like? Like when I come home from work and I'm tired or frustrated, how do I treat people when I'm tired? And God, I give you permission to speak into my life. Now, it's hard to find these pockets of solitude. So sometimes when I'm driving to work, I don't turn on my favorite podcast. I don't turn on anything. I'm driving to work and I'm saying, God, you have permission to bring to mind how I treat people with my language choices. Now, let me just say this. I don't think Satan created the internet, and I don't think he created smartphones. But when John says the whole world is in the power of the evil one, it means Satan works in broad categories. I, I'm no doubt he's the architect of the sexual revolution of the 60s. But listen, Satan wants anything that will destroy our ability to focus and do solitude. He doesn't care what it is, Netflix or smartphones. I had a flip phone for 10 years, a flip phone. Because I didn't want all that with me. I have a computer that can launch missiles. I have a computer that is a state-of-the-art computer. I just don't want that in my back pocket. But my promotion to the Winsome Conviction Project, I had to get a smartphone because of all these uh, 
things I had to do. It is everything I feared it would be and everything I love about my smartphone. But it has is, it is destroyed my ability to focus. And studies have been done about our technology, how it's re literally rewiring our brain. So we, we need to find pockets of solitude, okay? They're hard to find. Maybe get up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to get up 15 minutes early. I'm not going to open my computer, check emails. I'm not going to turn on my smartphone. I'm going to meditate with the Lord. Second discipline, biblical memorization, right? We, we memorize what Paul says. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification. I memorize that. I think about that. So as I'm going home from work and I'm frustrated and tired, I say, Lord, I need you to be with me. Help me guard my mouth when I walk through that door. Let me not voice my frustration. Then the last one could be fasting. Fasting is a really interesting discipline. Fasting doesn't mean that you just give up food. It can be food, but it can be anything. It's giving up one thing so you can focus on another. So let's say you give up junk food. It's, it's fine to have junk food, but you're giving it up because you want to focus on God. So when you walk into, again, Biola, Satan lives in our kitchenettes. I walk in that kitchenette, there's a bunt cake that literally speaks to me audibly. Tim, I'm right here. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, but, but now I know I'm fasting from junk food. I walk in, I see it, and I go, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it for the next three days. I've said no to junk food. So I turn away from it, practice my no button, and then I go do something else. I, it could, my wife and I love Netflix. My goodness, you wonder why the Great Commission has not been fulfilled? Netflix. <laughs> it's awesome. Netflix is awesome. It's like four in the morning, and Noreen and I are like, okay, just one more. One more. <laughs> Let's bring this baby home. We're almost done, right? It's craziness. But, I, but we say on a Wednesday... After dinner, we're not turning on the TV. Just on Wednesdays. That's all we do. That's fasting. So we finish dinner. We're going to grab that remote control. Oh, no, oh, it's Wednesday. Nope, we're going to say no to that so we can focus on something else. You practice your no button. It takes roughly 21 days to develop a habit from psychologists. So now I'm developing this no button. So I walk through the door. I'm frustrated for whatever reason, and I'm about to say something. And I go, nope. I'm not going to say it because I've exercised that no button when it comes to fasting. That's what Paul's talking about. Now, most, now, here's why martial arts just doesn't work. People come to my martial arts school. It's Krav Maga, Israeli self-defense. And they walk in and they just, hey, how do I break a brick? Or like, when do we get to the samurai swords? Or I want to do this jumping sidekick. And I'm like, what? Okay. You're going to start with something called first fist. It's the most boring thing you've ever seen, but you will literally practice it the rest of your life. And they're like, yeah, I'm out of here. Right? Dallas Willard said, most of us have a vision for our lives. We just don't want to go through the middle. America does not want to go through the middle. We have a vision for our marriage. I just want to put all that time and energy into it. I have a vision for my family, but if it means that, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm up for losing 10 pounds. This weekend, right? Uh, yeah. I was like, what, are you going to cut off an arm? How are you going to lose 10 pounds? Right? But we, we are horrible at this. And I think this is spiritual battle. I honestly think this is spiritual battle. And, and the Western church, we have lost our minds when it comes to spiritual battle. Do you know roughly 20% of everything Jesus had to say had to do with spiritual battle? Every New Testament writer mentions it. John says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The Bible starts with spiritual battle in the book of Genesis with the garden, Adam and Eve, and it ends with spiritual battle with Satan, the great dragon, being thrown into the lake of fire. Spiritual battle is here. So you better believe Satan is attacking this church. But he's doing it in a way that we don't realize he's doing it. Remember, remember go back to Genesis. Remember it says... The serpent was the most crafty of the animals. Do you know what crafty means in Hebrew? Subtle. It means subtle. If he would have walked up to Adam and Eve and would have said, rebel against God, Adam and Eve would have said, no, that's ridiculous. He's our creator. But he worked. I, I have a chapter of this. I have a book on spiritual battle and marriage called Defending Your Marriage. And I analyzed Genesis, how he subtly did this. Now, this made sense to me. 
because I eventually got my black belt, but when you're a red belt, you spar the black belts in Shaolin Kung Fu, full contact. It is full contact. Now you're wearing a mouth guard. You're not allowed to punch to the head, but you can slap to the head. Man, a slap to the head can really work. So I remember standing across from Kent, okay? Remember, I drove here in a minivan. I have no illusions of being Bruce Lee, okay? I'm standing in front of Kent, but, I, but now I'm a red belt and he's a black belt and my instructor's about to say go and I don't know what I'm thinking is gonna happen, right? I'm kind of thinking, you know, <laughs> I, I'm kind of thinking that. So he says go and I just remember being like this and I'll never forget what Kent did. All he did was kick my calf. He just went pop. And I was like, what was that? That was nothing. Get out of here, that was nothing. Pop, hit it again. I was like, this is like being nibbled to death by a duck. <laughs> what, what is this? This is nothing. Then he did it again, and it, it caught my calf, and it stung. But I tell you, I was fine. If anything, I was getting pretty bold. So I'm thinking, dude, you can kick my leg all the time. I'm about to score on you, right? Then he, I'll never forget what he did. He faked it. He went, and I looked straight down, and he hit me with a left hook. <laughs> a left hook is not even kung fu. He just popped me with a left hook. I literally went on, my, I, I went on my knees. He got me right on the air. I went right on my knees. Afterwards, he said this, love sparring the red belts, right? <laughs> three kicks and a left hook. The three kicks were a distraction, absolute distraction. It was the left hook. By the way, it never worked again. Never worked again against Kent. Kent would pop that cap. I'm like, dude, you do that all day long. I'm not looking down. I know, I know you're doing the left hook. So what's the first thing the scriptures say? Know the schemes of the devil. Know what they are. The modern church has no idea what Satan does. No idea how he does it. I mean, there's bad books about spiritual battle and there's really good books about spiritual battle. But men and women, I promise you, Satan's working in this church. He is absolutely trying to get you guys to be divided, angry, bitter. So we better know what his strategy is. We better know the telltale signs of demonic activity. So I'm often asked, what's the difference between the ancient church and the modern church? And here's my answer. The ancient church would have assumed spiritual battle is happening. It would have just assumed it. The modern church in the West says, you got to prove it to me. Prove it to me that it's happening. And, and I think Satan just delights in this because he's absolutely going after each one of us in ways that we don't perceive it. But once you learn what his techniques are, you're not going to fall for the left hook because you know what the kicks are. We have got to become educated in spiritual battle, but we're kind of embarrassed by it because we're Westerners. But man, Jesus was not embarrassed by Satan. Uh, and Satan mostly operates in your thought life. And we, we have to become proficient, what Paul said, take your thoughts captive. And we, we have no idea what Satan's doing. So I want to open up, we have 15 minutes left. Now you can ask me about spiritual battle. I'll give you what I think are the top five signs I read 20 books on spiritual battle from the leading authorities on spiritual battle. And I asked the question, wouldn't it be interesting if there were signs of the demonic that all 20 mentioned? That was my top five power list. Now there are other things that were mentioned, but not everybody mentioned them. The top five, everybody mentioned these top five. It was really wild to consider what that top five were. Um, so let's, do you want me to tell you the top five or should we just, yes! What do you tell us? You're all about to die, but wow, we're out of time. No, all right, here we go. In no particular order, number one is anger. Now, listen, anger is a human emotion. There's even righteous anger. The anger that they talk about is consumes you. You can't stop thinking about it. You can't stop talking negatively about this person. You go to bed thinking about this person, you're so angry. You wake up thinking about this person, you're so angry. We've all been there. Anybody who's been married, you know exactly what this is like, right? I mean, come on, you're just mad. And you're, you can't believe she fell asleep. I'm so mad and I'm laying here and she fell asleep, right? That, that, that could be demonic activity. That, I mean, that could be it right there an anger that consumes you and you can't get. So that's why Paul says, do not let the sun go down in your anger as not to give the devil a foothold. Okay, second on the list. Interesting, violent dreams. Made everybody's list. Violent dreams. I started to think that unprepared dreams could be even demonic activity. 
When I have an event coming up, I wake up in the middle of the night, my heart's going crazy. You know those crazy dreams you have? That you're, you're back in school, you thought you only had four classes, you actually had a fifth class? And now you're about to take a final in a fifth class you don't even know you had? And you're like, what? And you wake up, right? That could be demonic activity. Next on the list, uh, what we call catastrophic thinking. Every time something is mentioned, you think of the worst possible outcome. So your kids come to you and they say, hey, we want to go on a summer missions trip. And you immediately think, no, because of this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Now listen, wise thinking is the book of Proverbs. So of course you're going to think wisely about your son or daughter going overseas. But if you're consumed with negative, catastrophic thoughts, right? uh, the pastor says, hey, we're going to have a giving program for our church to do whatever. And you immediately think, no, we'll go bankrupt. We'll go bankrupt if we do that. That could be demonic activity. Next on the list, you no longer believe the best about God. You used to believe the best about God. He was in my corner. He was for us. He's watching out for my family, my church, my business. But now you've lost that. And Philip Yancey in a book called Disappoint with God said that can happen because of one big event or a thousand small events. And, and by the way, this deconversion thing we're seeing is people giving up on God, saying, I don't think God looks out for me. I don't think prayer does one thing. Now, listen, that could just be disappointment or it could be demonic activity where a demon is just stoking the fires, okay? Last one, you no longer believe the best about yourself, right? Listen, it's one thing for me to think. We, we do, we're about to do it at the end of the next week because it's finals, course evaluation, where my students will evaluate me as a professor. Okay, so if I get a negative comment, I, I could think, well, you know, I can improve as a professor. Of course I can. But if I think, oh, I'm the worst, I'm the worst professor, right? Then that, that could be demonic activity. It could be you thinking I'm the worst mother ever. No good mother would ever say that to their kids. And I just said that to my kids out of anger and Satan saying, yeah, you're the worst. You're the worst mother. And I can't go back to God. That could be demonic activity. The last one would be, un, you don't, um, Charles Kraft, who wrote over 20 books on spiritual battle, said the number one way Satan gets a foothold in your life is you don't forgive, is the number one way that you open a door. So men and women, what we need to do is pray spiritual battle prayers. And that means we say them out loud. Demons cannot read your mind. Satan cannot read your mind. Nowhere in scripture, the only being that's omniscient is God, and no way do we give that to Satan. But there's a lot of evidence in the scriptures that he can plant thoughts. King David in 2 Chronicles, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, Judas, even Jesus, many people speculate. When Jesus is standing on the mountain in Jerusalem, I've been there. It's not much of a mountain. And Satan says to him, look at all the splendor of all the earthly kingdoms. Well, you certainly couldn't see that from the mountain. So many people think, Clint Arnold being one of the top Ephesian scholars in the world, says, most likely, Satan gave him a panoramic view of all earthly splendor, past, present, future, and Jesus, of course, rejected it. So we need to control our thought life. So I would say, if you think Democrats are evil, I think that's a, that could be a sign of spiritual attack. Now, do Democrats do bad things? Absolutely. Does the Democratic Party do things that would be labeled biblical sin? Absolutely but vice versa. Absolutely, vice versa. And if you think that isn't true, then I don't think you're, you're, you're addressing this in a way that's fair. I think both parties are at fault. I think both parties absolutely live out biblical values. One of the most powerful times at Bible University, we took one of our absolute top scholars, who's a Democrat, one of our top scholars, who's a Republican. And they both sat down, and the first question was, criticize your party. What's the negatives of your party? And both of them were really articulate. To say, look, I'm a lifelong Republican, but I would say this about our party. And the Democrat did that. Then what do you admire about the other party? And both of them said, okay, I admire this about your party. I admire It was life-giving. Two people absolutely who knew their stuff, absolutely committed to one party, but could, could see the good in the other party, didn't demonize it. I think this demonization today is well-earned term because I think that's what's going on. When you paint a person as all good or all bad, that is, that's what we call splitting in psychological terms. My camp is all good, they're all bad. 
tell me one good thing about President Biden, and I've had students say, I can't think of one. You cannot think of one positive thing about President Biden. We got work to do, right? And I think we need to broaden our thinking. I think Satan is at work trying to split us along many different lines, and we just need to fight back with spiritual means to do it. So the middle conversation is hugely important. But if we don't do the bookends, if we don't prepare spiritually our hearts or how we talk about people after the conversation, that middle conversation goes nowhere. It has no traction, will gain no momentum whatsoever. So men and women, I think we need a revival in this country. I think we need people repenting and saying, you know what, this is a pretty great country. I've lived overseas. I lived in the uh, former Soviet Union for a year. Uh, this is a pretty good country. We got problems, we got issues, but I'll tell you what, we need to again embrace the idea that we're Americans. And we need to look to the left and the right. This is Robert Bella in his wonderful book called Habits of the Heart. He said, we've lost the idea that we're in this together. And I think what's happening today is we, we have the attitude of, I don't care, I, I, California, you can leave. We'd be better off without you guys anyway. That attitude has really sunk into our country into the church and into Christian institutions. We'd be better off if you guys just left. I think the Apostle Paul would be shocked to hear that kind of language. And by the way, let me just end with this. The reason we can be so cavalier about leaving is the church at Ephesus couldn't do that. We actually went to Ephesus and Artemis was there. This massive pagan god ran Ephesus. So if you're a Christian, Every day you're looking at Artemis, and Artemis is so unbiblical that you knew as a Christian we have an enemy. The enemy is Artemis. The enemy isn't my brothers and sisters. The enemy is Artemis. I think as the Christian church in America, we've grown soft. We have people who absolutely want to curtail our religious freedom. They absolutely want to reel it in. And we really need to come together, not just Christians, but we were talking about this on... on uh, 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 the podcast. Listen, we need to pull together as faith communities. This is, comes from Peter Kraft, a Catholic uh, Christian philosopher. The, secularism is coming after religion. And we all need to be a voting block. I mean, we all need to stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters when it comes to religious freedom. Okay, now listen, do we have disagreements with Muslims? Absolutely, we have disagreements. My, my students read the Quran cover to cover every year. There are things we deeply disagree with Muslims about, but we all agree on one thing. You ought to be able to practice your religion in the United States and not be infringed upon by the government. So I can stand with a Mormon believer, uh, a Mormon, uh, and, and just say, listen, we, we have real disagreements, right? I, I'm deeply troubled by some of your beliefs, but we agree on one thing. You, you need to have the right to be a Mormon in this country, and I need to have the right to be an evangelical in this country, right? And that's a massive voting block. And my son, who graduated from law school as a constitutional scholar, he said, Dad, the fight is coming to us, like big time. We need, to, we need to fight as a unified group against people who want to absolutely take away our religious freedoms. So we need to start thinking strategically. And I think the church at Ephesus, that was easy because Artemis was right there and they're looking at him. So we have enemies. I just don't think your brothers and sisters are one of them. We have true enemies. So let me pray for us. I love what this church is doing. I love the fact that you have an institute. I think this idea really needs to catch on, that other churches take it seriously, so I applaud your leadership for making time for this. So let me pray for us. And if, if you disagree with what I've been saying tonight, that really was Rick Langer, my co-director. If you love what I'm saying, well, thank you very much. So, Lord, we come before you. We take seriously that we're your ambassadors. We think of what Paul said to the church at Corinth, that we represent you, that you make your appeal through us. Father, we think of what Paul said about unity, protect unity, that we are not to split over disputable matters. Father, we take seriously what Jesus said about spiritual battle, that it is a reality, and we need to be aware of that and fight against it. So, Father, thank you for church leadership. We are called to pray for our leadership, and we do leadership of this church, the leadership of Biola University. We're called to pray for our president, our leaders, and we do so. Um, Father, let us be biblical, but biblical in both what we believe and how we speak. 
that we have to be both of those, not just one. So, Father, we give tonight over to you. I pray it'd be a great conversation starter in the weeks to come as we think about these important issues. But we do pray this for Jesus' sake. In his name, amen. So how many of you learned something tonight? You're like, man, that was really cool. Can you just raise your hands? Yeah. Please raise your hands. How many hand. of you tonight, Tim said something that really ticked you off? Can't you just raise your hands? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, that was awesome. I hated that. Right? <laughs> That's a sign of, I think we're on a good path. Okay, just a couple of uh, final thoughts. Uh, you've heard us talk about this institute. We really tried to get it going this year. It's dedicated toward helping us becoming, uh, let's see if I can remember this, biblically literate, uh, kingdom-oriented, and cultural shapers, right? So we need to know the word. Now we need to be focused on Christ and his kingdom, and we need to be able to influence our communities, right, without it just be influencing us. So the first person that we have brought in is Tim, and we brought him in twice this year because we really felt like, man, one of the big things we've got to do is we've got to learn to be able to talk amongst ourselves, right? So next year, the, uh, Drew has been working on bringing in Isaac, is it, I, I, tell you Isaac I Adams. Isaac, Isaac Adams. Adams. Yeah. yeah, so that is, that is really something to pray about, man. We really, this guy is good. We would love to be able to bring him in. Okay, final, final words. Um, we do have the Bethel Summit coming up at the end of August. That is our, a lot of you guys are leaders, right? And this is where, this is our inspiring event, looking ahead to, um, to what we're going to be doing leadership-wise for, um, for the whole year. And we actually have a guy coming up from, um, uh, actually coming over from South Carolina. Yeah, from South Carolina, um, who will be uh, speaking at that. He's, he's a, an expert on leadership development. He's actually been meeting with our, a big part of our staff now for several months. We've, we've had uh, four different meetings with him. We'll have one more. The big thing is what we're trying to do is we want to, you know, we talk about making disciples, but we've never been, never, We've, never, we've not been great at it, and we want to be great at it. We want to be good at people development. We want to be good at investing in people and building people up and making people strong. That's what we want to be all about. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and I'm going to go ahead and pray for our church. Like, wither Bethel Church. Where are we going? We've taken some hits. We've taken some hits from COVID. We've taken some other hits. A man's got, the Lord's got a future for our church. He's got a present for our church. We need to hear his voice. Part of our future is tied up in what Tim has been sharing with us. How are we going to deal with people? How are we going to come together? It's hard. We've all felt, <laughs> we all felt like a couple spears of anger tonight even. But we can do this. We can do this. We follow Jesus Christ. That's who we follow. Man, I'm a, like, I'd love, there, I've got, you guys know, I've shared some of the podcasters I, that I listen to and probably shouldn't have told you who I listen to, but anyway. Um, man, the one we listen to is Christ. That's what we're all about. We follow him. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Just really appreciate you guys taking out this, this time. May, um, may we apply this. May we learn to really, as we go into conversations that we know are going to be difficult. Let's, let's do our pre-work. Let's have a good conversation, apply the principles the best we can, and then let's, let's be careful how we talk about people afterwards. Okay, you guys are, obviously you guys, just like always, man, free to hang out. Let's encourage each other. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, you pray, Tim. I'm going to go ahead and pray for our church, right? Lord, we are one part of your body. We don't think we're the best part of your body, but we are, we're just part of your body. But we want to be the church that you are leading us to be. I pray for boldness on our part. I pray for love and compassion on our part. I pray that we would address, that we would face these issues, many of which are ripping us apart and ripping the church and our country apart. I pray that we really would be a light in this community. Once again, not because we're better than anybody, but because we're following, following you, Lord Jesus. May you fill us with your spirit. May you give us the, may we, may we tap into you for the resources that we so need. So the Lord, we are not fooled by the devil and overcome by bitterness and anger and wrath toward others. 
thinking the absolute worst of other people or thinking the absolute worst is going to happen to us or to our church. Catastrophic thinking. Lead us, Lord. I just pray your blessing upon every single person here. Thank you for bringing them tonight. Thank you that we're not alone. Thank, that we get to do, thank you that we get to do this together. Thank you. In fact, it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Cool, man. We'll see you guys Sunday.